some people lemons and they'll make lemonade, friends. You give Ray Comfort lemons and he will make kiwi, raspberry, watermelon, strawberry lemonade. Yeah, we don't know how he does it either, but he is the rumple stilt skin of evangelism. And today we're gonna see what Ray Comfort spun up when he was told he couldn't preach at his favorite weekly evangelism spot. It's a dangerous thing to tell Ray Comfort. Well, friends, joining me as always in this cloistered at home, Wave the Master edition, are Ray Comfort, Mark Spence, and Eddie Roman. Do you know what Rumble Stills can look like easy? Like Eddie you, Roman. Ray. <laughs> <laughs> like Eddie Roman. <laughs> it was me. Yeah. Well, Ray, we're going to be talking about some fun stuff today. But before we get to that, guys, how are you surviving the COVID-19 insanity? Well, I heard that Los Angeles just extended their stay at home uh, order until August. Yes, uh, we all heard. So and glad I don't live in Los Angeles. So glad. <laughs> I do. Yeah, we all work there, though, and we're not able to get to our office. But we're not letting that stop us. As I said earlier, we're making some really cool drinks with the lemon that we've been handed. All right, so uh, we're going to talk about that today. But, Mark, what do you've got going on? Tell us. You've been doing some exciting stuff lately. Fill the well, people my Facebook. In. <laughs> my Facebook page is uh, lighting up with these abortion memes. People are coming out of the woodworks. It's unbelievable. The vileness from the pro-choice side is uh, really unbearable. But I really like that little feature where you can mute anybody that uses any foul language, and they think that it goes out, and it doesn't. It's all automatically hidden by Facebook. So thank you, Facebook, that you ha offer that feature. But next week, I have... Uh, as of right now, five uh, abortion Zoom uh, debates that are set up with people. Wow. So I'm excited. It's an opportunity to talk about the pro-life position, but also to share the gospel because what we want is a change of heart, not just a change of mind. Yeah. Amen, Mark. That's great. Hey, Mark, real quick, because I, I loved it so much, I shared it immediately. Can you summarize for us that, that post you did that's catching fire? Yeah, it was something to the effect of, it's crazy that we live in a society where you have to go to a back alley in order to get a haircut, but if you want an abortion, well, Planned Parenthoods are wide open. Come on in. Wow. Yeah. That's, uh, it's pretty insane when you think about it like that. You and know? that stood up a few demons, eh, Mark? Oh, boy, did it ever. <laughs> Unreal. You know what? I was talking to, who was it? I was talking to someone the other day, Ray, and they were talking about how no matter what you do, uh, people go crazy. And I think one time you put a period as a post. Or chocolate cake. Chocolate cake. <laughs> That's right. It was a picture of a chocolate cake. <laughs> yeah, people start flipping out on you. Amazing. Well, Ray, real quick, too, before we jump into more things, tell us about your, your big cow. Cow. <laughs> Holy <laughs> cow. Well, Holy for the cow. last week, I've been driving the freeways most days to Huntington Beach, which is 20 miles there and 20 miles back. For me, it's really hard because I have to stand on the seat to see over the steering wheel. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> but it's a hassle. And then I have to find a park in the parking building, carry, you know, two uh, mic stands and cameras and everything. And then I thought, well, I should just set up outside my house on the lawn with a big sign saying, I'll pay you for an interview because people walk past the house. Right. And then I thought, you know, there's about there's about a quarter of a mile from here, there's an area with a cow. It's a very realistic looking cow. That a very expensive cow, by the way. It's $100,000 for this stupid thing. Unbelievable. But anyway, um, it's getting some purpose now because I went there, set up my cameras and two microphones six feet apart or six feet under, and immediately while I was setting up, uh, a car stopped and two ladies came over and did interviews. And the next day I got terrific interviews. One was a gentleman that got very upset with me because he said that I, I was saying it's not enough to stop doing evil. He had lied and stolen and done things that are wrong. He says, I stopped. I've reformed. You should be happy that I've reformed. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, try that in a court of law. Judge robbed the bank, but I haven't done it for a while. The judge is going to say, that's great. You're going to jail. That really upset him. So it's nice, colorful footage. And it's just by the uh, bellflower cower. <laughs> That's awesome, Ray. Now, we want to jump into uh, what, what, what I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the wonderful lemonade-based cocktail that you made, Ray, when you were told you couldn't preach. Now, we've talked on the program before about how there have been different stages of, of Ray going to Huntington, and they said you can't, but then 
you know, you could, and then he did this and that, but he got a word, no, you can't preach here. So Ray, tell us real quick before we jump into the video about what you did. Well, I took the uh, uh, two microphone stands, uh, two uh, um, kind of camera stands, yeah, camera stands, and two, I purchased another iPhone and set them up six feet apart and put a sign up saying, I'll pay you to come and talk to me, uh, two <laughs> gift cards. And uh, um, people started lining up to, uh, to get interviewed. It was absolutely wonderful. I was thrilled. So that's what this footage is about. I think this is the second day I did it. Oh, that's great. All right, Ray. Let's see what Mr. Comfort did. So what's your name? My name is Jasmine. Are you a Christian? I'm not a Christian. Well, I believe in Christ, but I'm not a Christian. Are you going to go to heaven when you die? I hope so. Are you a good person? Yes. How do you know if you're good? Because I follow God's laws. Which laws? The Ten Commandments? Yes. Have you broken any of them? Can you remind me what they are? Yeah, you shall not lie. Have you ever lied? I have. Well, that one's broken. Yeah. Have you ever stolen anything, even if it's small in your whole life? Yes. Well, there goes the eighth. So you're a lying thief? <laughs> you know, the Apostle Paul, have you heard of him? Yes. He said his hope was in those Ten Commandments to save him. But when he looked at them, they condemned him. You know why God gave the Ten Commandments? As a mirror so we might see ourselves in truth. So Brian, do you think there's an afterlife? You know what, I really don't. You don't? I don't think there is. So this is it? This is it. Doesn't that make your life hopeless? You've got Not no... at all, not at all. Are you afraid of dying? Yes. Do you think you can do anything about your death? I don't, I don't think there's nothing I can do. Do you believe I... in God's existence? I do, but I don't know how far back I go. I only go because everybody says there's a God. But as far as... What about creation? That's evidence there's a God. I have no idea where all that came from, but they say it came from somewhere. Well, see the building behind me? Right. That building is proof there's a builder. Oh, well, somebody did it right, exactly. Yeah. So somebody made all this. Uh, uh, obviously. Bible says the heavens declare His glory. What do you think God requires of you? Well, I don't know what He requires, but I know they say we're supposed to be good. You're good enough to make it to heaven. I don't know if I'll make it to heaven because I don't know if there is a heaven there. Well, do you know how to know if you're going to make it? Just look at the Ten Commandments. Well, well I want to say that I do good enough where I help everybody else maybe want to get there. Okay, well, that's good. So let's go through some of the Ten Commandments. Do you think you've kept them or broken them? Uh, probably broken a few. Probably. You've broken the one about adultery? Uh, no, that one not. I, no. no. No, I'm good. I'm good on that one. What yeah. about murder? Yep, good on that one. You're good on that one? Have you ever hated somebody? Uh, yeah. Well, the Bible yeah. says when you do that, he who hates his brother is a murderer because God sees your thought life. Mm -hmm. Now, you said you've never committed adultery, but listen to what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, you've heard it said by them of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks upon a woman to lust for her has committed adultery already with her in his heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Uh, probably. Now, Jesus said, if you look with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. Have you ever looked with lust? Yes. Have you ever hated somebody? Have I ever hated somebody? Yes. Well, the Bible says if you hate somebody, you're a murderer. Not doing very good, are we? I've asked for forgiveness. So, Daniel, have you ever used God's name in vain? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by vain. God, that means, uh, have you ever used his name in what? I don't know what vain means. For cussing or not giving it to you honor? Uh, OMG. I, I want to say no, but I've heard people say I have when I was younger. Yeah. Okay, you were younger when I met you. I, I understand. I'm in trouble. However, if I'm praying to God and if I'm acknowledging that I have committed sins and I'm sincerely asking God for forgiveness, then I think God will forgive me. Well, you're doing everything right except one thing, and it's the most important thing. You're like a man on a plane, has to jump. 10,000 feet, doesn't have a parachute, but his plan is to try and save himself by flapping his arms. It's not going to work. He needs to trust the parachute. And do you know that God has given a parachute to humanity that we might be saved? Bible calls Jesus the Savior. You were younger when I met you. Right over his head. We didn't even catch it. Uh. <laughs> Ray, where do you come up with this stuff? Department of Annoyance. Yeah. I was telling someone the other day, we were talking about this, and I said, you know, Ray has so many lines that are, that are just ready and waiting because human nature, right? I mean, so many things. It's like the whole thing when you, when you take someone through the commandments and you say, what does that make you? The first thing they say is a sinner. 
right? They want to generalize. And you always say more specifically, right? <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. It's just that, and I love, you have them lined up, Ray, like Pez. You know those Pez dispensers? One comes out, burp, another one pops up. <laughs> anyway. Uh, okay, so let's, <laughs> let's dissect this a little bit, friends. Uh, so Brian said he doesn't believe in the afterlife, and this is it, but yet he's not hopeless. So uh, how do you grapple with that, guys? Eddie, I'm going to go to you on this. Someone says to you, well, look, I don't believe in an afterlife, but I'm not hopeless. Man, life is good. Yeah, you know, um, being lost doesn't always mean that you're uh, sad or depressed or anything like that. It just means you're apart from God. A person can be smart. A person can have a bright future and a career and, and all that kind of stuff as far as the world's concerned. But at the same time, they can be a fool when it comes to the things of God. Proverbs 22, right. 3 says, the prudent sees evil and hides himself, but the naive go on and are punished for it. And we all know that death is coming. It's not a mystery. We all know we're going to die someday. But to just know it's coming and not be concerned about the afterlife and, and just be focused on this life. And you know, so often we'll hear people say things like, well, God will do whatever he's going to do, and, and I'll be fine with that. Well, that's half true. God will do what he's going to do, but you won't be fine with it when you get judged. So it's, it's so important that we look ahead to the afterlife and just take into consideration what's going to happen to me after I die. And that's why we preach the gospel. Yeah. You know, if I may say that some people say, well, it's inevitable. We're going to die. You can't do anything about it. The analogy I use, is like standing on a highway with an 18 wheeler heading for you, 80 miles an hour. It's like 50 yards away. And you say, well, it's inevitable. I can't do anything about it. Of course you can. You can get out of the way. And I'm sure you would. And every ounce of energy we've got should be put in to finding out how we can get out of the way of death. Because if we ignore God, he's the only one that has the answer. We're like in a, we're like in a room that's lacking oxygen. It's getting less and less oxygen. There's only one door, and it says God. And people won't go to that door because they don't like the sort of moral responsibility. But he's the only way out of death. And, and so that's what we want to do, confront people and say, do you think God has an answer uh, to your dilemma of death? Yeah. Amen. And Mark, you know, I, I wanted to point out that the, the man said that he doesn't believe in Jesus, but he hasn't committed murder. He hasn't committed adultery. Those always seem to be the go-to ones, especially the murder. I've never killed anyone, you know, but Ray brings out the spiritual aspect of the law, right? If you've, if you've had unjust anger or hatred, you've committed murder. If you've looked with lust, you've committed adultery. How important and how effective is that? Yeah, that's a difficult one to get away from when you find out that God sees not just your thoughts, but the intentions of your actions, right? If you've had hatred towards someone, you are a murderer. If you look with lust, you are an adulterer. You can't run away from this. Not only can you not run away from it, but God has made sure you can't run away from it because he's given you a conscience, right? It's that impartial judge that sits in the courtroom of your mind that will continually haunt you in the morning, in the evening, while you sleep. Hmm. Our conscience is a very good thing that God has given us so that we seek him and grow for him, so that we cry out to him for mercy. You're right, you know, God is a judge and he's not like an earthly judge. He sees everything and he doesn't need a prosecutor to stand up. All he needs is access to your mind and it will be a case closed scenario. Wow. Hey, man, I'm saved. And that makes me shudder. <laughs> Access to your mind, you know, I, I mean, you think about it, it says in Hebrews that all things are open and bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do nothing is hidden from his sight. I can't think of anything more terrifying for the unbeliever, really, because we know as Christians, when God looks at us, he sees us through the blood of Christ, we're clothed in his righteousness. But for the unsaved to think that nothing has gone unnoticed and nothing is forgotten if they don't repent and place their faith in Christ. You know, it's so easy, my guys. Um, often on Saturday mornings, I'll go out on my bike real early with my dog to ride down to work, and it's very fresh air. And the instant I get out on that bike on the road, I'm taken back to when I was about 13 and used to ride to school on winter's days. Wow. And I'm amazed at how my mind has got memory banks that record oh. things that I've absolutely forgotten i mean that's about 500 years ago yeah. but it's instantaneous it's a quick recall in the second and to think that god has seen everything knows everything and we've got everything in our subconscious it's got a conscious it's going to come back to us on that day of judgment 
That's amazing. It's so weird too, how we can relate to that. I, I was thinking about that recently. Sometimes I'll smell like freshly cut grass and it transports me back or even the weather will be a, a certain way and I'll, I'll go back to a certain time. It, it just- Or a song, just the yeah, buzz of a song and you're there. Absolutely, or, or a smell or something. You know, that the recall that God has given us. I mean, that enough should cause people to worship, right, Eddie? I mean, just the, the, the amazing features that we have in our bodies as people. Yeah, sometimes I'll see people with hair and it'll take me back to when I had hair. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So, Ray, real quick on Jasmine. We can't, we can't skip over Jasmine, my apparently Arab sister. I'm a bit partial there. Yes. But, Ray, uh, she, what a precious young lady. But she said something that I want you to touch on. She said, well, yeah, you know, I know I've, I've committed sins and stuff, but, but God will forgive me. Um, why, why is that a dangerous uh, perception, Ray? Well, there's, the scripture said there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of that way is death. And it's the way of self-righteousness, of uh, having an image of God that's congenial to you and you're to him. You've got his smile, and if you do something wrong, you just say, I'm sorry. Well, that doesn't work in a, in a civil court with a, an earthly judge. You say, sorry, judge, I broke the law. He's going to say, good, you should be sorry. You're going to jail. And God's exactly the same. Our sincerity means nothing if it's not coupled with truth. I can be on a plane heading for New York, sincerely believing I'm going to Hawaii, and it doesn't change the direction I'm going. So mm. sincerity must be coupled with truth. And that's why we preach the truth and love to sinners. You know, I've got this image in my mind of that young lady standing to one side, waiting for one of the guys to finish at the microphone so she could come up. She was just like this, so excited to come up, which wow. is kind of unusual. And I believe it's because she was searching uh, in a heart for the for the truth. Yeah, and uh, I'm excited to, to continue with her. But before that, Mark, real quick, uh, you know, I, I'm glad that Ray touched on sincerity because that, that's something we've come across throughout the years when we're witnessing to someone. You know, you can talk to a really nice Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness or a, a Buddhist or whatever, a Muslim person, and uh, they seem so sincere. And a lot of people today will translate that into like validating what they believe because they're so sincere. What do you say to someone in that regard? I might just ask them, do you believe that it's possible to be sincere and to be wrong at the same time? Mm. And if so, I'd ask them even for an example. You know, can you give me uh, an example perhaps of another worldview? If you're a Mormon, do you think Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witnesses are sincere yet? Do you believe that they're sincerely wrong? Is there some sort of a litmus test that we can take that we can find out whether or not what we believe is not just sincere, but it is true? Yeah. Think of like David Koresh and all the danger that he had uh, committed just because he was sincere and the people that followed him were sincere, mm -hmm. but they were sincerely wrong and it led to a tragic outcome. You know, the Bible says that there's a narrow road that leads to life and broad is the way that leads to destruction. So, the only way we can really know if what we believe is not just sincere but true is to stand on the foundation of God's Word. God's Word is true, and we are sanctified. We are set apart by His truth, and not to forget that Jesus said that He is the truth. Yeah, that's so good, Mark. You know, we've talked before about the contradictions that, that exist, and people don't even realize realize it or realize what they're doing. Recently, I posted on my Twitter page something that I dubbed years ago, and it says, to respond to sin sinfully is sinful. And one of the first comments was someone blasting me sinfully for how wrong I was in what I said. I just like, man, that's hilarious. All right, friends, enough jibber jabbing. Let's get back to what happened. If God judges you by the Ten Commandments on Judgment Day, we've looked at four, you're going to be innocent or guilty? I'm definitely guilty. Heaven or hell? By far. If there's a hell, hell. Does that concern you? Because I don't know if there's... It doesn't because I don't know if there's a hell. Well, it horrifies me because I know there is. Well, see, there's a difference because you know. I don't know, so it... Well, if you saw a man heading for a thousand-foot cliff, he's a blind man, and he says, I don't know if there's a cliff here, and you know it's there, you're going to plead with him to turn around because you love him, you care about him. Exactly, exactly. I so would. the thought of you ending up in hell horrifies me. It takes my breath away because God gave you a conscience. You know right from wrong, so you're without excuse on Judgment Day, and the Bible says... God is just and holy. You by no means clear the guilty. So tell me, what did God do for guilty sinners so we wouldn't have to go to hell? Do you know? I have no idea. Do you know? Well, Jesus died on the cross. We broke God's law. The Ten Commandments are called the moral law. Jesus paid the fine. 
Do you know his last words on the cross? Do you know what they were? Very strange words. He said, it is finished. That's weird. That's a weird thing to say when you're dying. But what he was saying is, the debt has been paid. And even though you and I are guilty of breaking those commandments, heading for hell, God can forgive us. He can release us from the courtroom because Jesus paid the fine. And he can do that which is legal and right and just because the fine was paid in full by Jesus on the cross, who then rose from the dead and defeated death. What I've tried to do with you, Jasmine, because I care about you, as I put your feet on the edges of eternity and tell you it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of God. And I've tried to make you fearful because the Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Through the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil, hoping that you'll see that fear that you feel. Oh, I'm going to hell. You'll see it as your friend, not your enemy, because it'll drive you to Christ where you can receive God's mercy. Is this making sense? Yeah. Jasmine, there are two things you need to do to be saved. You need to repent and trust in Jesus. When are you going to do that? Right now. Right now? Today I've tried to give you a knowledge of sin. I've turned the mirror of the commandments on you so you see you're not a good person. That'll help you see sin in its true light, that it's real serious, and help you to be sorry for your sins. Yeah. Because the Bible says, Godly sorrow works repentance. So the only way you really repent is if you're sorry for your sins. Yeah. And so that law will help you to see how serious it is. Yeah. So you're going to get right with God today? Of course. It, it, it makes sense if it's reality. Man, I'm trying my best. No, no. If it's reality, it makes sense. Yeah. I don't know if it's reality or not. Yeah. I just met you. You're saying this is going to happen. That's going to happen. And I should trust what you say and believe it because you know, right? Well, not really. But that's where we stand right now. Yeah, though. no. There's a little more to the equation. You're going to die. Is that right? Of course. And that's because God's given you the death sentence according to the Bible. You have sinned against God. Is that right? Correct. If He judges you by the commandments, you're going to be guilty. Is that right? Definitely. So that's enough for you to say, man, I need God's mercy. So just think about it. Go away from here. And as you walk away, careful crossing the street because I don't want you to die in your sins. <laughs> be careful. But just say, I wonder if that's true. And pray about it. Say, God, if, if that's true, confirm it in my heart. I'm not saying believe me. I'm saying believe the Bible. Right, right, I've right, told right. you straight Bible. Daniel, you've been a real good sport. Thank you for listening to me. I really appreciate it. Do you have a Bible at home? You know, I've had several, but I have trouble reading them. Well? My sister's given me a real simple Bible where it's got the nice, easy words to understand, and I just have trouble putting it all together. You know what? I can read. I know words. I know what, I can define words, but I can't put it all together. Well, the way to put it all together is get right with God, and it'll come together. It'll make sense once you're right with the Lord and you're born again. I've heard that. I've heard that. I've okay, known. so somebody loves you. They gave you a Bible, and I love you, and thank you for listening. All right, buddy. It was a pleasure. Um, so I was just thinking about that in the car. Like, wow, I totally lied to my classmates. But then in the car, I was like, God, forgive me. God, forgive me. You know, like. Okay. Do you want to ask God to forgive you now? You pray, and I'll pray for you. Okay. Okay, where you go. God, please forgive me for lying. God, please forgive me. God, please prevent me from committing any future lies. God, you are the greatest. God, we are so small and humble compared to you. God, you are the mightiest. You are the wisest. You are the forgiver. You are the most merciful. Thank you, God, for everything. <laughs> so what do you think about what we talked about? I mean, seriously think about it as though you're going to die tonight? I have because my friend has talked to me a lot about about this, to be honest. Your parents? No, my friend. Your friends are Christians? Well, no doubt they're praying for you. No doubt this is a, what's called a divine encounter and God's hand is upon you. Do you have a Bible at home? Uh, yes. God bless you, Jasmine. Nice God to meet you. God bless you. What's your name? Ray. Ray. God bless you, Ray. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Salam alaikum. Wow, Ray, that sure turned out well, didn't it? I mean, you couldn't preach in your regular spot, but it's a good example of God causing things to work together for good. Yeah, I thank God for his grace because the traffic was very, very loud and I could hardly hear some of the things they were saying and I had to lift my voice so it sounded like I'm kind of yelling. But those mics are quite incredible. They were directional mics that picked up the voices, but uh, it was very loud. On the yeah, phone. the audio was, it was great. You know, Eddie, it's 2020 and yet both Jasmine and Daniel basically Daniel said, I have no idea when Ray Mench asked, you know, what did God do to, to provide forgiveness of sin? And Jasmine just, you know, shook her head. No, what, what, what's the deal with that? It's America, man. You'd think people would know. 
You would think, you know, and I run into a lot of Christians who say things along the lines of, well, everyone has heard the gospel. Everyone in America has heard the gospel. They got the radio. They got churches. People went to church. The fact of the matter is, no, that's not true. I was at a mall not too far from my house a while ago, and I was talking to two guys um, who moved over here from Japan in the last year, and neither one of them had heard the name Jesus Christ before. They'd never even heard the name. And so what we need to realize is that we live in a mission field. There are people from all over the world coming to live next door to us. And in a lot of cases, they, they have no clue as to what the gospel is. And the same is true for people in our own churches sometimes, unfortunately. So yeah, we keep I, preaching. I, I remember when Mark and I pastored years ago, we had a missionary speak at our church. And, and they talked about how I think it was in India. They'd go into some villages and they'd say, yeah, do you know Jesus? And they'd be like, oh, no, he might live in the next village. You know, I mean, that's so foreign to us, but that's a reality to some, you know. Uh, you know, Mark, I want you to touch on this. Ray, uh, Ray used the word hell quite a bit uh, in that video, and he uses it often. Uh, and we do as well when we share with people. Uh, what's the dynamic of people no longer wanting to talk about hell? And why is it important to well, I, I think that people avoid hell because a lot of pastors avoid the word hell. You know, Jesus spoke more about hev, hell than he did about heaven. And when you ask people that are Christians, so-called Christians that are upset at you while you are opening or preaching or evangelizing one-on-one -on -one and they're overhearing, and they say, you know, stop, stop, this isn't the way Jesus did it. And you ask them in front of everybody, you know, well, where will these people go if they die in their sins? Yeah. They begin to balk. They begin to say things like, well, to a not very good place, to a Christless eternity. They don't want to use the word hell, but hell is used so often inside of films, and undoubtedly it drips from the mouths of people in a situation and circumstance that it shouldn't be. What yeah. the, to right. express themselves. Even oh. people claiming to be Christians, they, they do these things, and we need to be careful of that. We use it the way Christ did it and no more. Amen. Amen, Mark. Well, guys, once again, hard to believe we're out of time. That went quick, but what a joy it was to see what God did. Again, friends, when we have circumstances that may not be favorable, we still step out in faith and do what we can, and the Lord takes those lemons and does the unthinkable with them. So we hope you've been encouraged, stirred, and inspired in the midst of what's going on in our world today, and we want to continue to do that with you. Hope you join us again next time here for Way of the Master, Home Edition. This is the Evidence Bible. We can hardly keep it in stock. It's everything you've ever wanted to know about apologetics and reaching the lost, including 200 of the most commonly asked questions of the Christian faith. It will arm you with practical training on evolution, atheism, the teachings of Mormons, Hindus, Muslims, and Jehovah's Witnesses, and much more, including how to effectively, lovingly, and logically share the truth of the gospel. You will find that it's hundreds of inspiring quotes from renowned Christian leaders and its practical tips on defending the gospel will be a great encouragement. The Evidence Study Bible is available at livingwaters.com.